But uh, yeah, no, thanks very much, Brian and Henrik and Paul, for the invitation. It's great to be back in Copenhagen. I used to live here once upon a time, and it's a really fantastic city to be to be back in. So, for personal as well as work reasons, it's it's really enjoyable to be here. And I can see the conference has grown quite a bit because now I have to look two ways. But uh, I had a bit of trouble preparing the presentation because. Most of my presentations are very routine, they're very fixed. If I go to the Irish Wind Energy Association, I have like 300 slides about Ireland and wind energy. And if I'm working with the Irish District Energy Association, I have a lot of slides about Ireland and district energy. And like most Irish people, it's very easy to talk about Ireland a lot. But here I wanted to think about, are there things that I do or I'm involved in that maybe are of interest to people who are not in Ireland all the time? So I've tried to think about, over my experiences, what has actually worked and not worked and why it has worked. And that has been a bit of a strange experience to just stop and go, what are the things along the journey that have actually made a difference and have sometimes not always worked and, and sometimes worked? And it made me kind of stand back a bit and, and look at what I do. And then I thought about my very first big break. And my very first big break was probably back in 2008, once upon a time sitting in the west coast of Ireland in a university called the University of Limerick which doesn't specialize in poems or anything like that, but uh, that's where the, the, the word comes from. And I sat in a laboratory room with an A4 sheet with a very specific script, and I hope Henrik doesn't mind me telling this story, but I, uh, I was really nervous because it was the first time I called Henrik Lund, and Henrik, of course, is very well known in the energy business, and I was just starting out and trying to, to make my way. And when Henrik answered the phone, because I was so nervous, I pretty much read the entire A4 sheet in, I would say, about four seconds. And it all went very fast. And basically, the premise of my A4 sheet was, Henrik, can I come and visit you? And after saying the full A4 sheet in about 10 seconds, Henrik, at the very end, asked a question I did not expect, which was, do you play a musical instrument? <laughs> and this kind of threw me off a bit. I just read a full sheet about all the energy and things that I enjoy. And I said, actually, no, I don't, which he found strange because I was Irish. But he said, ah, OK, no problem. You can still come, but I just wanted to check because at the Christmas party, we have a band in the department. <laughs> and I was like, all right, that's great. As long as I can come, I'll do an instrument if I have to. And that kind of, when I started to think back about my journey, I realized there's an awful lot more to what makes things successful than just your technical knowledge or your understanding of something. A lot of the time, it comes down to people. And that's a very big, important part of the jigsaw. And that just made me think about other things. And I, after playing around with the English language a bit and thinking about those experiences, I came up with my three Ps. So regardless of where I was, what I think has made some of my experiences work, not always, but, but along the way, some of them actually work out. And I suppose just to explain to people where exactly my journey went to from the University of Limerick back in 2008, the good news is Henrik did let me come and visit and got to work with the group for many years. So I spent a lot of time in the University of Limerick and then moved on to Ulbor University and worked a lot on the Heat Roadmap Europe project and some of the Danish projects and helping the guys in the team learn a lot about smart energy systems and really getting into the nuts and bolts of energy modeling and, and trying to influence people like that. And then back in 2017, I moved back to Ireland and as well as moving into a different country and back to a different environment, back to my home country, I moved kind of out of academia and more into the industry space. So I started to work for the Irish Wind Energy Association, uh, first as head of policy and now I work as the CEO there. And because it's very hard to leave the pipes behind, I actually set up the Irish District Energy Association with another former Ulbor University student, which will give you an idea of what they do to you in that university. And uh, we set that up in 2017, which is probably Ireland's newest energy association. And these are two very different worlds. It's in an industry world. And I just, I suppose, in preparation for today's event, started to think across the university world, across the industry world, what exactly do I feel has been a bit consistent and things that maybe other people could learn a bit from. And uh, that's where I've come up with the, the three Ps. And I suppose just to give people a flavor of how these worlds differ, so my day-to-day -day job as CEO of the Irish Wind Energy Association is Ireland's largest energy association. We're about four times bigger than the power plant association. So we're a very well-established group. We have 150 companies, we have about 15 staff, and we love wind energy. And we represent everything from the very early stage consultants and planners all the way through to the developers, manufacturers of the turbines and so on. So it's a, it's a very cutting edge industry to be part of. And I have a very big announcement, something I was very excited about last year to tell all my own people back home. Last year, Ireland passed out Denmark for the first time in onshore wind penetration. So the motherland has been passed. Now, we don't like to mention that you also have offshore wind, but you know, for onshore wind, we are now at 29% and Denmark is at 28, so 1% more. So uh, that's a... 
I always uh, tease them how we've just uh, superpassed the, the motherland in, in wind energy, and that's very exciting back home. But of course, we're now moving on a journey with offshore wind. Denmark has done a, a lot of work on offshore wind, and Ireland is just starting to, to move into that sector. But this is the world I live in, in the Wind Association. Ireland is an island. We have a really difficult electricity system to manage because we're an island. Like, over the month of August, as an island in the summer, there was 35% of our electricity coming from wind. Sometimes there's up to two-thirds of our power on an isolated power system purely coming from wind energy. It's a really difficult thing for the system operators to balance. They don't really have any neighbors that they can rely on for power all the time. So uh, it's quite a challenge. And it, it, so even though the number mightn't tell the true story because we have that island piece behind us as well, and that means in the wind business, you're very much at the forefront. Like I get calls sometimes from last week, I got a call from Romania. Can we come and understand how you do this with the wind energy? Whereas the district heating world is very different because we just set up in 2017. That exercise is much more about here's a technology that has been proven in hundreds of other places. Can we just learn from that and, and copy it? We're not at all at the innovation stage. We're simply at the let's learn how to do it and, and try and copy it. So our main task with the District Energy Association is not to be teaching the rest of the world or going around with some nice statistics. It's mainly about just bringing people together to try and increase the knowledge base of what district energy is and, and how it works. So at the moment, we're at about, this is, a, I think this slide came from about three months ago. We had about 15 members. We're now up to about 18 members. But it's a much, let's say, it doesn't require full time day to day because it's a, it's a bit of a learning curve. So these are just the, the two worlds that, I, that I'm trying to take some learnings from as well as I didn't go into talking about Albury University. You'll all know a bit about that. And then this is my final world that makes me think a little bit because one of the most things I miss as well as all the wonderful people about Copenhagen is the biking lifestyle. Here I never owned a car for six weeks and I used to, to bike a lot. And when I moved back to Dublin, I also continued to bike a lot. But now I bike in a very different world. I actually find it a bit strange that we use the same world for the things that are on the left as on the right. Because on the left, I used to have a lovely pathway all to myself. And sometimes I'd even be on my mobile phone looking up things as I cycled along. In Dublin, I'm between the trucks and the cars and the buses. And at 8 o'clock in the morning as you cycle through the city centre in Dublin, you start to ask yourself, why am I here in the middle of a bus? <laughs> and why you decide to have my own bike lane? And I think the reason I'm bringing this up is because I start to realize since I moved back to Ireland that rules are probably one of the most important things that exist around us in every sector. So this is a relatively simple world. When you go to the politicians in Ireland and you complain about bikes, bikes are not complicated. Bikes are two wheels and a piece of metal that have looked the same for 100 years. And the solutions are not complicated. It's a picture on the left with a lane and you say this makes it a very easy thing to do. But what is, is very complicated is this. Moving from, let's say, today's energy system all the way over to something that's really complicated and sector coupling, and I'm sure a lot of people will talk about that over the next few days. But I fundamentally believe that we have the same problem with both of those worlds. What we're doing really in this transition is trying to change the rules in different ways for different things. And that's what I kind of do now day to day as part of my work with the Wind Energy Association. I try and go around and convince people to change the rules so that wind energy can expand in Ireland. But then I thought back to my time in Ulver University and that's kind of what I did as well, just in a different world. I tried to convince people with maybe journal publications or academic research, this is why you change the rules. And changing the rules is, is never easy. And this is where I got back to my three Ps. What are the three things that I always felt helped me move that bit closer to, to changing the rules and getting us a bit closer to a, to a smart energy system? And this is them after playing around with words quite a bit. These are the three things that I feel that if you can master these in any kind of a change, you have a good chance at making a small step forward, whether that be in convincing people to do bike infrastructure or in this instance, trying to convince people to move to a cleaner, more renewable energy system. And I think sometimes people forget about some parts of this jigsaw. And I think if you forget one of these, the challenge becomes really difficult. So my three Ps are first, you have to form a position. So I've often been with people where I'll meet some of my members. I have a lot of experience with people complaining now that I represent 150 com companies. And they'll come to me and they'll say, David, we need to be able to build more wind by allowing us to do X. And I would say, well, how exactly can you do that? 
and they wouldn't really have thought of the detail. They just say, well, I just want to be able to build the wind farm. I haven't really thought of exactly what I'm looking to fix. So the first thing I would say people need to do is actually form a specific position about exactly what it is you want. You have to actually be able to say to somebody, I always say if you got stuck with the energy minister in an elevator for 60 seconds, what would you tell him you actually want? What would be the very specific sentence? I think the second thing is you need to get stuck in the elevator with that energy minister. And it doesn't have to be the energy minister, it can be different things, but, but it's back to the story I mentioned about, about Henrik earlier. You, you have to have a person that will listen to you, and more importantly, a person when they listen to you can actually do something about it. You know, it's very easy to just talk to people that can't actually then go and take your advice and, and do something. And it's very hard to find that person who can actually take your information and, and change something with it. And the final thing I would say is, what I, what I mean by that when they, when they can change it is, they have to be someone that can influence the rules of the game in the way that you want. And that usually comes down to, and I've used the word policy, and policy is probably not big enough a word to capture it all. It can sometimes be a regulation, it can sometimes be a new business idea, but you have to have someone that can actually go and do something about it with the position you have. And I know that this all sounds very high level, so what I've done is taken some of my experiences with Ulbor and the Irish Wind Energy Association and the District Energy Association and just tried to give you a flavour of how I think if you can tick the box beside these three things, you'll make at least a, a step forward. So I'll just give you some examples of what I think are, are good ways to do that. So the first one, and I'm taking it in order of my life, so I've probably learned a bit more over the years, but with the Heat Roadmap Your Project, I think when we sat down at the very early stages in 2012, 2011, I think we almost knew what we wanted before we did the analysis, which was we wanted to show that there was a lot of potential for district heating and a lot more than people thought. And in order to do that, we did things like Heat Road Map Europe, made the map, made the modelling and said, now we have evidence to prove our position. And once we had proven our position, we had to find somebody who actually could do something with that position. So we spent a lot of time travelling back and forth to Brussels to visit the people in the European Commission to say, here is evidence for you now to change one of the rules to show that district heating can do more. And I don't think we knew at the time, but what ended up evolving out of that was the EU heating and cooling strategy in 2016, where the European Union saw that heating needed a lot more representation, and then they made this heating and cooling strategy, and now we had a piece of the rules that we could influence to try and change the rules of the game to make district heating more evident. And I think this is just to show how if you can tick the three boxes, you then finally reach the rules part where things change a little bit and things Im improve a bit forward. And this is, let's say, some of the details, and I'm sure many people like will make presentations today that are much more detailed than my points are, but I don't think it's, like, it's very important that you can formulate the position, and there's many different ways to do that, and the way we did it was with GIS mapping and some energy modeling. But I think it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be something that changes the, the current thinking. And I think that was our position in Heat Roadmap Europe was to formulate these papers. And then the people and the policy were the different trips and meeting these people in DG Energy and then eventually <coughs> getting the, the policy paper where in the top sentence of the vision and goals in the EU heating and cooling strategy, district heating was mentioned as one of the big important items. And that was a step forward. It would have been a lot nicer if they had some concrete goal or a specific target, but at least it was better than where we started in a few years later, where I remember the very first model said that district heating wouldn't grow at all until 2050. And this was now putting it up in lights. And again, I think it's because we had those three elements, not just the research, but then the people and, and the position also. So then I took some of those learnings when I moved back to the island. And of course, the first thing I did when I went back is made an energy model and tried to make an energy vision very much like the guys in Albury University do in a lot of the work they did. And we made a target for Ireland of 70% renewable electricity by 2030. And the reason we did that is because our government at the time had a target of 40% renewable electricity by 2020. And because we're an island and we're leading the way with a lot of things, they felt we've done enough. We have now shown that we can do 40%. Why should we continue to do a lot more work and try and lead the way? And of course, my members were knocking down my door saying our business will stop unless this changes. So we made a position. We created a very specific position, which was this is how you can change the target from 40 to 70%. Then we had to find the person in the government department responsible for the target. And then we had to convince them, along with a lot of people they speak to, that that was a good idea. 
And then we found a policy which was the EU Commission's National Energy and Climate Plan had a deadline that it had to be submitted by the end of last year. And we said, right, that's the rule we'll try and change. That's the person that needs to change it. And here's a concrete position they can rely on to make that change. So it was those three things, again, just looking at what worked, that I think resulted in us uh, trying to influence the, 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 the dynamic around that conversation. And of course, there is a lot of detail in this report. I don't think the government read it in detail, but at least they had something they could see was based on some really detailed modeling and so on. And then once the government had that, in March of this year, they decided to change it from 40 to 70%. And that was a little bit of luck because it just, when the policy had to be decided on, they had a concrete position they could turn to and say, here is some evidence that we can rely on to change our position. And that gave them some confidence. And I think it was those three elements, again, that kind of repeated itself, but this time in a very different context. It wasn't EU, it was Irish, and it wasn't about district heating, it was about wind. But I felt the steps that I went through were very similar to what we had done with, with Heat Roadmap Europe. And then the final one is with the District Energy Association. So now instead of having a very well-established organization and instead looking at a brand new association, it's almost like the three steps again. But this time I had to adjust, let's say, what were we trying to do? Because we were never going to convince the Irish government to put a target for district heating into law. They don't even know what the pipes are. They, don't, they never even heard of it. So our, our objectives were very different. We started out with the position that we just want to show them that it's worth considering similar in some ways to what we did with Heat Roadmap Europe back those many years ago. So we uh, somewhat replicated. So the Berndt and the Urban in the, the mapping team made us an Irish heat atlas to show that there is potential for, for district heating in Ireland. And we use this to try and convince the people in the heat division of our energy department that this is a technology they should consider. And then instead of targeting like a national target, we targeted this demonstration climate action fund that the Irish government run and now they have committed to fund two demonstration projects for district heating. So a much smaller step but at least a step towards a bit of progress. And so these are just some images of the type of work that Berndt and, and the guys have developed which is the Irish district heating atlas and then Berndt is going to kill me because these are old results but you can uh, upload those Berndt later. And uh, this just shows that we were able to demonstrate that if district heating was developed in Ireland, it could provide somewhere between 30 and 60% of our heat supply. And of course, our politicians thought that only the northern Arctic had district heating because it's too warm everywhere else to have it. But this was trying to change the narrative to actually places like Ireland can, can do this and it's technically possible. And again, this was our position that we walked around with and the people that we tried to change was the, the government. So we, we worked on things like their long-term vision for policy, which was the national planning framework, and we managed to get district heating mentioned a few times, and that started a bit of momentum. Then we started to focus on this climate action fund, where once the district heating was mentioned in the, in the, uh, the, the government's plan, you could justify spending some money on it, and that's how we've managed to get these two projects, two demonstration projects up and running. So there's two projects in Dublin, one that will use a waste incinerator that has a lot of excess heat and another that will use a, a data center that has a bit of excess heat. So again, it's kind of a same framework. I always feel like we do the same thing, but I feel like we apply it in slightly different, different ways. So these are my three Ps. And I think what I, the reason I reflected on this quite a bit is when I thought of my early days, and I think I focused a bit too much on the position piece. I think I always wanted to make sure I had the perfect model or the perfect piece of analysis. And I think that's probably what I call the killer P. It's where you get too caught up in trying to get the, the perfect kind of result out of a model. Whereas I think the most important, or what I call the queen P, is probably over on the policy side. Because ultimately, it's only when you change the rules of the game that the game changes. Until that point, no one really cares because the gate rules are still the same. But once you change the rules, then people really start to care because now the, the rules of the game change. So I think what I learned is that when you do develop a position, make sure that you find someone who can potentially use it and use it to change some kind of policy or regulation or new business idea and make it so that you can help move the dial a little bit forward. And the other thing I would just leave by saying is, you know, you can only do it one step at a time. You know, it, it can't be just, I, like I, you would love if you know, people would just decide, yes, we'll stop using fossil fuels. But I think it have become very real over the last few years that 
if you even just manage to change it by one step, that is a really good start because it's very difficult to change the mindset and the rules of the game and there's a lot of influencers. So you'll, uh, you'll move it a little bit at a time and eventually we'll hopefully reach our end goal. So that's, the, that's it for me. I hope people get a flavor. If you want to join the Irish Wind Energy Association or District Energy Association, that's my only plug. But otherwise, I hope you got a flavor of my experiences uh, at my time in different places trying to move that bit closer to the smart energy system. So thanks very much again.